Hello. Um, the last time I spoke to you about the nuclear test veterans case, which I've been involved in for a very long time, was when I spoke to you from Latvia uh, about the betrayal of the test veterans um, by the firm of solicitors called Hogan Lovells, who withdrew my evidence, which was critical evidence for the case, and had to do with exposure to uranium and alpha emitters at the test sites. Withdrew this at the last minute, just before the um, tribunal heard the case in January 2013. So, the, so, so now I'm going to talk. Now I can talk to you because um, there has been another appeal against this, and the decision of this appeal has been published. So I'm no longer um, not allowed to talk about this. <coughs> And I'll tell you what's happened since then. Well, the case was lost, as I say, because this is the 16 veterans who were appealing for pensions in the Pensions Appeals Tribunal in the lower tier. It was lost because the critical evidence for the case was kept out, and it was kept out by the, by the firm of lawyers, Hogan Lovell, who stepped in after the firm of lawyers, Rosenblatt, pulled out at the end of 2012. Now, all along, we thought that the Hogan Lovell lawyers were, in fact, um, if you like, bogus, that they, that they weren't really acting in the best interests of the, <coughs> the veterans that they were representing. Uh, and, in fact, we said this. Um, so this was one of the uh, causes for appealing against the decision. And that was that, so, so we appealed against the decision on the basis that my evidence, Busby's evidence, was excluded from the lower tier, hadn't been considered, and that this had been done by Hogan Lovells. And one of the, one of the things we wanted to say originally was that was that Hogan Lovells were were at fault here. But the problem was legally, if if Hogan Lovells were at fault, this was not something that we could appeal about, because you can only take an appeal to the upper tier on a point of law, and there's no point of law associated with a firm of solicitors betraying their own um, clients. Of course, they didn't tell the clients, the test veterans, that they were going to take my evidence out at the last minute. But just before the trial happened, just before the tribunal occurred, they did, they did hurriedly get in touch with them and say, oh, by the way, we're, we're not considering Dr. Busby's um, evidence, and is this all right? Well, actually, for, another, for a number of the, the, the veterans, it wasn't all right, and they complained. And at least two of these veterans, Anna Smith who was the representative at the end of her husband, Barry Smith, who had died of uh, pancreatic cancer, and uh, another veteran, Don Battersby, who was being helped by his daughter, Kay Battersby, he was still alive. They decided that they would um, get together and take an appeal. Um, in fact, I made a little video about this, which got me into a lot of trouble. So they took this appeal, and, and the appeal came up in the upper tier uh, before uh, 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 the judge, who was then the head of the upper tier chamber, Sir William Charles, a very, very important judge. And so right from the beginning, Charles um, considered our appeal, which was firstly on the basis that, uh, that they'd left out Busby's evidence, and this was unfair, uh, and the Treasury solicitor representing the Ministry of Defence, representing the Ministry of Defence, said, well, firstly, Busby's not an expert, because he hasn't got, a, you know, he's not working at a university, and he's a physical chemist and not an epidemiologist, and a whole slew of, of arguments to the effect that I wasn't an expert. Um, and secondly, even if I was an expert, I was an activist, and experts cannot be activists because an activist is biased and, and represents one side of the argument. Now, in English law, to be an expert, you have to be balanced. Of course, I would say I am balanced. It's just that the, the science that I have studied has shown me that this is a public health, a massive public health uh, issue. And therefore, I have quite rightly, I think, in, in, you know, uh, uh, been an activist or, or written articles in The Ecologist and so forth saying that there's this situation where the vets are being treated badly and that the current radiation risk model is wrong and nuclear power is killing people and all these things which you all know that I say. So this was up before the upper tier in front of the judge, um, Sir William Charles. So <coughs> in order to go forward with this, 
I assembled a team of old guys, about my age, some of them a bit younger. And these are Andrew Ades, who's older than me. He's a um, group captain, uh, he ex retired group captain, um, RAF, and uh, a man who I've worked with in the past in other test veteran cases which have been successful, which we've won. Uh, and then also Hugo, Ch Hugo Charlton, who's the ex-chair of the Green Party, who was a barrister, a criminal barrister. And we had Robbie Manson, who's a brilliantly clever um, legal expert, who has lectured in law at the University of Swansea and has helped us out in the past with various cases. Uh, and finally, Di Williams, who is a, a, a psychologist, but who has been interest for many, interested in many, for many years in the health effects of depleted uranium. And I first met him in... Um, in a conference in Hamburg in I think 2003. So this is this was the team, the Grey Panthers if you like. Anyway so we got together some extremely powerful pieces of evidence and legal arguments mostly put forward by Robbie Manson and Hugo Charlton uh, and they advised us quite from the beginning that we couldn't go for Hogan Lovells because actually it's not a point of law if, as I said if, if Hogan Lovells don't act in the best interest of their clients. If what happens then is you have to sue Hogan Lovells, or rather the clients, the veterans have to sue Hogan Lovells, and and um, there's no money to do that. That's that's you know that's a very very difficult thing to do. So we decided to go down a different route, and to talk about procedural irregularities in that Busby's evidence wasn't considered by the judge in the lower tier, which we did. And Robbie and Hugo put together some really clever arguments. Showing, you know, saying legally that that should have been done and wasn't done. Of course, Hogan Lovells were freaking out because they thought we were going to come after them through the legal ombudsman and all sorts of routes and so forth. So they produced statements to say that actually they had relied on Dr. Busby's arguments, even though they told the court that they hadn't relied on them. They then wrote statements which they signed under oath to say that, you know, Dr. Busby's arguments and all his evidence was before the court and should have been considered and so forth. So they were madly trying to wriggle out from any possible legal attack on them. Anyway, the judge, uh, when he first talked about the case at the beginning at the directions hearing he said well this guy Busby we need to talk to him we need to ask him you know why whether he is an expert or not and, and whether he's an activist or not and so forth so the Ministry of Defence have to bring forward, forth all of their arguments why Dr Busby isn't an expert and all of their arguments why he shouldn't be considered and why his evidence is worthless which they did uh, and then Dr. Busby has got to then respond to this, which he did. And then they respond to his response, which they did. And then he responds to their response, which he did. And they respond to his response to this one, and so on. You can imagine. This went, this went on for about a year. And I couldn't talk to you about this because the whole case was sub judice. And, of course, if the argument is about whether I'm an expert or an activist, clearly if I turn up on YouTube moaning about what's going on and telling the truth about what's happening, they'll say, well, of course he's an activist. Look, there you are. There he is on YouTube. And in fact, I, I did get into trouble in this case because I wrote a letter, wrote an article in The Ecologist about the case, and I wrote an article in The Ecologist about uranium, which, of which a little bit more uh, I'll talk about soon. So anyway, so this rumbled on and rumbled on, and eventually we got into court, uh, into the, into the uh, Royal Courts of Justice, this was really, you know, gosh posh, up in the Strand, around June... 2014 it all came together and there were masses of papers coming this way and that way and huge bundles of stuff from the lower tier earlier tribunals and lots of other evidence brought in and so forth and the poor judge I think was completely mystified by the piles of evidence that he had to go through and frankly I don't think he even bothered to go through it very very heavily and I mean I don't blame him to be honest because it's all quite arcane and difficult complicated stuff and the Treasury solicitor tells a pack of lies uh, in response to, to stuff that has been put in as evidence. So you have, it's a bit like a, a, a tennis match, you know, somebody says, clack, this is the case. And then the MOD solicitor says, clonk, no it's not. And of course the poor judge isn't a scientist, so he doesn't know how what's going on. So he thought, well okay, let's get Busby into the witness box and we can see how he performs. And then we, I can decide whether he's an expert or not, and whether he's biased or not. And of course, that's what happened. So I ended up in the witness box for three days. Poor old man. You know, you want to try being in the witness box for three days. I can tell you by the end of it, it's like a Gestapo session. You don't know whether you're coming or going. If they said to you, I put it to you, Dr. Busby, that you are a Martian. 
you would probably say yes, because you've just had enough of it, you know, you just want to get, get out of it all. Anyway, so after three days of all of this, the Treasury Solicitor um, QC, there were two QCs here having a go, um, interrogated me about whether I was an, <laughs> whether I was an expert or what whether I was biased. Queen's Council. Um, and so uh, it, it, it seemed to, to, to the judge after this interrogation session that I was actually biased, although I was obviously an expert, quite clearly an expert, because if you look at the transcription of this, of this interrogation, you will see that I managed to get all of my evidence about the test veteran situation and everything that I put before the lower tier. I put before this upper tier and it's all in the transcript. So I'll put the transcript up somewhere and you can read it if you can be bothered to go through all the tedious stuff. But what it means is it is there in the legal uh, domain. So it's, if you like, it's, 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 and this was all under oath too. So at the end of all of this tedious business, and, and I have to say that it was extremely costly and it was extremely wearing. And I have to thank all of my mates who, who worked themselves to death, all for no money. To do all this stuff. Not to death. Well, you know, almost. I mean, poor old Di Williams was wheeling in huge amounts of paper and sort of scrabbling through it all. Anyway, at the end of it all, the judge decided, Busby, you are not, a, you are not uh, allowed to be an expert witness. And the reason is because you're biased. And the reason is because you're an activist and you write articles in The Ecologist and you do videos just like this one. And of course, in, under English law, you know, you can't have an expert witness sort of wearing funny hats and playing the banjo and going out on YouTube saying that everybody's a crook. It's not allowed. Not to everybody. Well, no, not everybody. But anyway, you get the point. So, all right. Anyway, there's more to this. So we've got to the position where I can't be an expert. But of course, you see, the downside of that for them is that I can be a, a, um, the lawyer. I can be the representative. And in fact, the judge said this. When, when, when he was in, in, uh, being, being asked by, I think, Hugo or Robbie about the situation with regard to all of the evidence that I had given, he said, well, of course, you know, Dr. Busby doesn't, can't be an expert anymore, but there's nothing to stop him being a representative. So as I talk to you now, I am now the representative of these two appellants, and any, incidentally, any other test veteran appellants who want to, to jump on the bandwagon should get in touch with me, and I'll represent them as well in for a penny, in for a pound, and it's not going to cost you anything because it doesn't cost anything because I work for nothing. And the small amounts of money that we needed, although actually we probably will need some more now for the next lower tier, were kindly supplied by the low level radiation campaign as a result of a, of a gift from an old lady who died and left some money to us, to the low level radiation campaign that is, which is not, not very much money, but you know, enough to scratch along and pay for a few fares. So that kind of brings us up to the present day in terms of the decision. And now the question is, what happened next? Well, the first thing that, the, and this is the this is the important bit. This is this is why I'm talking to you, because now that I was a, as soon as I became um, the representative rather than the expert, of course the Ministry of Defence freaked out. They thought, now what? Good Lord, this may be not a good idea. So we went into the final directions hearing at the beginning of December. I think it was the 2nd of December, so quite recently. And, and uh, uh, Group Captain Aides had, a, had a, a speak, some speaking notes in which he wanted to point out to the judge that, that, um, that the Treasury solicitor had continued to tell lies whilst they were cross-examining witnesses. So they misled the judge and they made a load of dishonest statements. I mean, they're all there in the transcript, and, and Andrew had, had, had typed out the transcript uh, onto various sheets of paper to show the judge, to say, look, you know, you're saying all this stuff about Busby and about how he's this and how he's that, but at the same time, what you don't do is you don't make any orders about the, the other side. Because, of course, you know, the reality is, is an expert witness is always on the one side. That's why, that's what happens in law. It certainly happens in the United States, where I've done a lot of this work, is that the oil companies, they bring in their expert witness, and the, the people with cancer bring in their expert witness, me, uh, and then we fight it out. So I say, this is how it is, and, and they say, that's how it is. And it all has to do with interpretation of the data. So here's all the data, 
and I interpret it this way, and they interpret it that way. But what they do, and this is particularly true of the Ministry of Defence in all of these cases, is they choose the piece of data that they like, and they throw out the bits of data that they don't like. And then, of course, the judge doesn't know any different. Now, in the lower tier, the judge would have had to know different because I would have been there with all my bits of data, but, of course, Hogan Lovell threw it all out. So you only get, you only get the Ministry of Defence side of things. So anyway, at this direction sharing, we have Andrew Aides get, going to get up and give his notes about how they tell a pack of lies. And part of the lies that they were taught, t telling were, was about the fact that there was no uranium at Christmas Island. But in the meantime, I had discovered, I had been, um, I had been originally sent some documents from the judge in the lower tier that showed that there was an enormous amount of uranium in the fallout. And so using this data, I wrote an article for The Ecologist about U234. You can find it on The Ecologist website. And luckily, it was picked up by Counterpunch in the United States. You'll see why luckily in a minute. So Counterpunch took it off and published it in the United States, and The Ecologist published it over here. But as soon as Andrew got up, the Treasury solicitor, the Ministry of Defence lawyer, Leanne Markai, QC, jumped up and said, we can't hear any of this because it's subject to the Official Secrets Act. What? Everybody stopped. The judge immediately took the thing he was going to read and gave it back. He said, I'm, I'm not touching this, it's the Official Secrets Act. This was like an explosion. So the whole thing stopped. Nobody ever got to, got to see anything about the dishonesty of the Ministry of Defence as lawyers, because the whole thing was finished, that was it. And the judge said, well, all right, you know, I, I direct that this happens and that happens and the other happens. Busby's not an expert, thank you very much, good night. And so that was kind of the end of it. But it wasn't the end of it, because then th what happened was then that the Ministry of Defence decided to get legal and terrifying and threatening about this document relating to, um, to the, the uranium at the, at the test sites, which they, they said this document um, was subject to the Official Secrets Act. This, this, is a, this is, incidentally, I, I, I haven't told you, but this was another document that, that, that was sent to me by an Australian veteran, Alan, Major Alan Batchelor. And it was a document um, which showed the concentrations of uranium in enriched uranium that was being used in the, in the British nuclear tests. And from those concentrations, we could show that the amount of uranium-234, which is, which is the isotope that I'm concerned about, was enormously high. So there was a huge amount of U-234 in the fallout. But okay. that document was unclassified. The document, the document says atomic confidential, but in the title it says UK unclassified. So quite naturally I assumed it was unclassified, and, and Alan Batchelor assumed it was unclassified. But the Ministry of Defence said, no, no, it's atomic confidential, nobody's allowed to see it, UK eyes only, only if you've got security clearance, blah, blah, blah. So the next thing that happened was that we, I, got, I got emails from the Ministry of Defence solicitor, a chap called Mohammad Saleh, you know, good old English name, um, telling me that I had to, 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 to put, the, put the document into a sealed envelope and lock it in a cabinet and it would be collected by MI5. I mean, I'm telling you, this is all real, OK? This is, this. And then Andrew got another, he got one of these communications and so did Di Williams and so did everybody who had this document. Of course, meantime, I'd left. I was on my boat in France, you know, probably just as well, or they would probably clap me in the j in jail. Still am. So I, so I, I did as I wrote back. I, I wrote to Andrew and I said, I'm not going to do anything of the sort, you know. Stuff the Ministry of Defence. If they want to put me in the court, they can do so. Um, so he got back to Mohammed Saleh and he said, you know, Busby's not going to play ball with you. You know, he's a bullshit guy. He's not going to do as you ask, Official Secrets Act or not. And so um, Saleh then wrote another letter saying, you know, we will go to court and Busby will be banged up in the clink and he'll never see daylight and sent to the gulag and all this stuff. <laughs> it's very serious threats they were. Very rude, arrogant, awful letters, you know, terribly frightening letters. If you're the sort of person that gets frightened by this stuff, which I'm not. Because I thought, what the hell, you know, What's, jail isn't so bad. But then anyway... And I also thought it would be a cause celebre, so we would end up in the international courts, you know, and everybody would come and write letters to Amnesty International like they did with Bandashevsky and so on, and it may still happen, which is why I'm doing this video. Okay, so in the end, Andrew said to me, oh, look, you know, um, perhaps you better just back off, you know, this and that. 
And then I thought of my talk, which you can also see on the internet from Latvia, about being a peace commissioner, you see, and talking about peace. And, and in my life I've always found it, I found it rather, rather a bad idea to stand up in front of powerful people, because they can crush you and say, oh, whoops, sorry, afterwards. So I thought, OK, I'll back off. So I backed off. So I wrote to Muhammad and I said, OK, all right. Um, I'll, I'll, I, in fact, I burnt the document on my boat to start the fire when, when I first came here because it was cold. So he seemed to accept that. Well, it was true. Uh, and then he said, well, what about all these documents that you've written on the ecologist and so forth? And who have you sent it all to? So I told him who I'd sent it to, and I told him about the ecologist. He said, you, you know, he said, you've got to take it off the ecologist site. You've got to withdraw the ecologist argument, all this stuff. Anyway, I won't bore you with this endless, tedious uh, attack on, on me and my colleagues uh, under the Official Secrets Act. Uh, it's, a, it's enough for me to say the following. First of all, I don't think that those documents we're talking about, either the one released to me by the judge or the later one from Alan Batchelor about the concentration of uranium in, in the enriched uranium used by the British, um, I don't think they were secret. Okay. So the thing is, why are the MOD getting so hot under the collar about it? And I, I, have a I have two possibilities for this and a few speculations, which I, I'm going to say and then leave you with. The first possibility is that when the MOD saw the speaking notes at the last um, tribunal directions hearing in December, they panicked. They thought, this is it. Because this chap, Andrew Ades, you know, he's a tough guy. He's going to get up and he say that we've been telling lies. And when the judge actually investigates it, he'll find we were selling lies. We're the Ministry of Defence solicitor. We're the Treasury solicitor of the British government and we're telling lies in court. What's going to happen? So the only way that they could escape from that would, would be to, to, to drop a bomb. And that's what they did. So they, they stopped him saying anything about their dishonesty. By, by calling attention to this document and saying it was an Official Secrets Act document and it had to be withdrawn. And in fact that worked. So that was the first possibility. That worked pretty well. The second possibility is that it's all true and that these are, or, or had to be, considered to be secret documents for some other reason. So there was another reason why these had to be secret and not in the public domain. And that led me to think about what those reasons could possibly be. And I spent some time thinking about this, and I'm going to hand you a couple of possibilities. The first and most likely possibility is that they absolutely don't want anyone to know that vast amounts of enriched uranium, or just uranium, or U-234, or U-235, all of these isotopes, vast amounts of this stuff were in the fallout from the atomic weapons. And that just, we're not just talking about people on the test sites now, we're talking about all over the world. Because we know that in the last 10 years, and I know anyway, because I've done a huge amount of research in Fallujah and, and Balkans and places where they've been using depleted uranium, and this is the same stuff, uranium particles. They don't want anybody to start saying that this uranium is, uh, is being produced in the fallout from nuclear weapons. So that's like a secret. They want to cover that up. And there is some evidence that that is the case, because Major Alan Batchelor was onto this long before me. He was onto this in 2001, where he gave evidence before the Australian Royal Commission, and, and he figured out himself, very cleverly, he figured out that the missing fallout nuclide is uranium, that the bombs are made of uranium, that when it explodes it produces all these nanoparticles that float down or come down in the rain after the explosion. And they're fantastically and awfully toxic, even from their radioactivity, never mind about all these other weird effects that they have because they bind to DNA. So that's the first possibility, that, 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 that what the MOD are trying to do is they're trying to cover up the evidence of the existence of this enormous amount of uranium in the fallout. So that's the first possibility. The second possibility is more interesting, because in 2014, in May of 2014, the United States government declassified a document um, which, was, uh, which was a document written in 1976 by a worker um, for, the, for Rockwell International. So this is the Rocky Flats site. Where they, where they, they, and what he was doing is he was measuring gamma radiation from enriched uranium. And this is all quite, quite boring, a sort of boring document. And it was declassified in, in 2014 this year. 
But what it shows is it shows the concentrations of uranium isotopes inside enriched uranium. So in other words, you know, enriched uranium contains U238, U235, U234 and U236. And the particular enriched uranium that they were using to, to do this, these, these measurements was called ore alloy. So that's Oak Ridge alloy is what it's short for. You can look it up on Wikipedia. It's the enriched uranium produced by the United States in the 1950s, or I mean after 1945 in fact, for all of its weapons. So the, the nuclear weapons that were produced by the United States were made out of ore alloy. Or, or large amounts of them were made out of ore alloy, this enriched uranium. And we've got, if you like, the recipe for ore alloy. This was declassified in 2014. But the interesting thing is this, that the recipe for British enriched uranium, that the British used for their nuclear bombs, was in this document sent to me by Major Bachelor. And it also has the formula for the British enriched uranium. It tells you how much U238, 235, 234 and 236 is present. And here's the point. They're the same. They're the same. Now, the British had all sorts of methods for extracting enriched uranium, you know, for enriching uranium, uranium enrichment plants, so that they could get the, the crude uranium from the soil, you know, from the ore, and then turn it into uranium hexafluoride and then then at, at a site in North Wales called Capenhurst, where they produce the enriched uranium. It's not a very big site, incidentally. They produce, presumably, according to the story, they produce the enriched uranium that was used to make the, the British atomic bombs and the tests that were carried out at Christmas Island and in Australia. And, uh, and this, this, this stuff couldn't possibly conceivably have the same formula as the ore alloy made in the United States because it's a completely diff different method of extraction. So the ratios would be different. It's not possible that they would be the same. There's only one possible reason why they're the same, is that they are the same. Is that from, from 1957 the British were being supplied with enriched uranium from America. Now this would explain why when I asked under the Freedom of Information Act for all of this information from the Ministry of Defence, they said that there were a number of documents that they refused to release to me on the basis that if they were in the public domain, they would affect Britain's relationship with a foreign power. I thought, what? This is something that happened in 1955. How could, how could knowing about it now affect Britain's relationship with a foreign power? It doesn't make sense. But now it makes sense. Now it makes sense. Because if you read all the books about the British independent development of the, of the hydrogen bomb and the atomic bomb that the British, British developed independent, independently under Sir William Penny, of the atomic energy re of, uh, of the atomic weapons establishment in Aldermaston, you know, you hear you hear a tale of how clever they all were. You know how they independently figured out how all it worked, and they put it together, and bang, off it went. And then it wasn't really quite good enough, and the next one, bang, it it did go. And then by the time they got to Christmas Island, wow, look at that, three megatons, woof, bam, you know, all in the British ray, you know, rule Britannia, we've made a. And of course, at that time, it was very important that the British had their independent nuclear deterrent, because as Churchill said, if we don't have an independent nuclear deterrent, we lose our seat at the high table. You know, we're no longer a world power. That's what was happening in the 50s. And of course, what this, what this evidence shows, I mean, I know it's really stupid evidence, like two tables of, 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 of formulae. It's just like, you know, this is how you bake this cake. That's how you bake that cake. And wow, look, it's the same. It's the same bloody cake. All right. It means that the British nuclear development of all of the nuclear weapons was under the control of the United States from way back, from right from the beginning, from as soon as they blew up the, most, the, 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 the bomb that actually was a hydrogen bomb. That must have been constructed using ore alloy, using Oak Ridge fuel. And that's the second possibility. That's why the Ministry of Defence are freaking out. Because, of course, this document wasn't important until... Oak Ridge, until the Rockwell document came out in 2014, nobody could have said anything much about the British bomb from just from the formula. You could say, oh, well, that's interesting. It does show an awful lot of uranium-234, which, you know, which is really bad. And, and so, you know, this is bad for, for people working on the site and maybe it caused cancer and all the rest of it. But uh, you couldn't have said anything about the origin of the material that they were using. But then, of course, as soon as in 2014 the United States published this thing, 
this paper that showed the formula for the Oak Ridge enriched uranium, then you can put two and two together and say, well, that the Americans were supplying the British with uh, enriched uranium. And there's a little, there's a little, little, little piece of inf interesting evidence that goes with this. In 1999, I defended as an expert, as an expert witness, those were the days, um, with Hugo Charlton, I defended these two old ladies from Greenham Common who cut the fence at the atomic weapons establishment at Aldermaston. One of them was called Sarah Hipperson, and the other was, um, I can't remember the other one, the name anyway, it's probably on the internet somewhere. Anyway, so round about that time, there was a big case relating to the discovery of an enormous amount of enriched uranium around the Greenham Common, United States Air Force Greenham Common Air Base near Newbury, where there was a child leukemia cluster. There was a big child leukemia cluster near the, near the USAF air base. Of course, by then it, it, it was folding, folding up. And there were a lot of these uh, Greenham Common women, who are the anti-war women, the, the band the bomb women, who lived in a camp at Greenham Common. Very famous camp. I know a lot of those women. And, the, and these were two of them that, were, that, were, that had cut the fence at Aldermaston. Anyway, in 1961, two scientists called Cripps and Stimson um, did a study of enriched uranium contamination around the airbase. And this was, this was released under the 30-year rule um, from the Public Records Office. And a chap called Eddie Gonzalez, Goncalves of CND got onto it and, and raised a fuss about the existence of enriched uranium near the Greenham Common Air Base. And he said that it was due to a bomb exploding you know, some nuclear bomb exploding or catching fire at the airbase. And in fact, there was a fire there. And we all thought that this was like British stuff being sent out to America. But of course, what it, what it seems to be now, almost certainly, is that the fire was consuming enriched uranium, which was being brought in by the United States Air Force to Aldermaston via the Greenham Common Air Base. See, it all goes, it all fits together. It all fits together, like sort of all these little bits of my life, all these little studies, epidemiology study here, child leukemia in Newbury, you know, Alan Batchelor's uh, um, acquisition of this paper that shows the, the formula for the enriched uranium used in the British bombs, and then this other paper from Rocky Flats that shows the concentrations of uranium enriched in the uh, enriched uranium in the American bombs. All right, so where do we go from here? Well, it could be that where I go from here is to jail. Um, well, I'm hoping not. <laughs> I'm hoping not. And partly that's why I'm making this video, because now that I can't be an expert witness, I can be an activist, according to the good judge William Charles. So here I am as an activist, telling you all out there what's going on. So I will act as a... As a, as a um, representative for the two uh, appellants, the two veteran appellants um, in the next lower tier tribunal. The, t the firm Hogan Lovells tried to knock the whole thing on the head, as you might imagine, because they absolutely don't want this to, to go ahead. So they said, oh, we don't want any more evidence, you know, in, br in brackets, we don't want Chris Busby's evidence. So they tried to tell the judge that they only wanted the next tier tribunal that he's ordered because he's overthrown the, the results of the first one. He wanted it to be reduced right down to very small size so they only heard a little bit of evidence from the last tier. No new, no, no new evidence was allowed in and no new witnesses were to be called and so forth. Anyway, of course, we said well, they shouldn't do that and the judge agreed with us. So, that, so Hogan Lovell's ploy didn't work. So they have to go off and think about what they're going to do next. So the only other thing that may happen is, the, is that the Ministry of Defence solicitor may appeal against the decision to the High Court. But we think probably he won't, because, because I think probably they'll lose, because there's no good reason to appeal this decision. There was no error of law there. And so it'll be, I mean, they might do it just to sort of stave off a bit of time. But anyway, if they do, we will certainly piggyback that appeal with an appeal about Chris Busby being an expert or not being an expert, or at least... Actually, I'm not sure that I care. I think I'd rather be a representative because then I can cross-examine their witnesses. That should be something. They're going to wish that I wasn't there to cross-examine their witnesses. And, of course, I may not be there. I may be in jail under the Official Secrets Act 1989. Thank you for listening. Or maybe Third World War brings us all out. Oh, yes, well, yes, well, of course, yes, that's right. And it could be there's a lot of sabre-rattling about nuclear weaponry at the moment in relation to the... To the 
to the Russians. And so, you know, it, this, this little business about the test veterans may be some side dish. And so it may be pretty irrelevant when it comes to, to the big one, if it comes off. But I've made another video about that. Because what we've learned through the test veteran cases is that small amounts of exposure to fallout are lethal. So just imagine what large amounts of exposure to fallout will do. Thank you for listening. Well, it just occurred to me there was one other issue here that I needed to basically run over, which is quite quite briefly. And that and that I I talked about the United States supplying the British with in, enriched uranium for the atomic bombs, and presumably therefore also the formula how to make the um, the hydrogen bomb. In fact, there was a. a a BBC documentary that I was involved in, I think in 2004, uh, the producer was Michael Thompson, and it was in the series called uh, Document, and it's since been taken off the internet, off the web, but but it was on the web at one point, and in fact I did have a tape of it, but somebody stole it. But this series Document, what, what it what it did is it found a load of documents that showed that the British didn't know how to make a hydrogen bomb. They just didn't know how to. And it's not straightforward. You have to figure it out. And they hadn't figured it out. So you, you have the position that Sir William Penny and his merry men at, uh, at the Atomic Weapons Establishment have all this pressure coming on them to make this hydrogen bomb so that Britain could have a seat at the high table. And you have to recollect that by 1954 onwards, Britain, Britain's role in the world was like rapidly going down the toilet. And the reason for that is that Britain had spent a huge amount of money in the Second World War defeating the Germans. And, and, and was basically bankrupt. And the only reason that they defeated the Germans is because the Americans stepped in and loaned them, and didn't give them, but loaned them lots of weaponry, bombs and ammunition and equipment and ships and so forth. And that, and that meant that the British had to pay the Americans back. And it soon became apparent that the Americans were not going to be helpful in this regard and write off the debts or anything, but to use that as a weapon over the British. Because uh, when the British went to invade Egypt after the Suez Canal crisis, it was the Americans that pulled the British out. And, and we're not quite sure exactly how that happened. We certainly know that it was American influence or threats that forced the British to pull out of, the, of, the, um, of Egypt. And that was ter a terrible situation for British supremacy in the world. I mean, when I was young, the British, British uh, had control of the oceans, had control of the, of, of the colonies and most of the atlas was pink. But after the war it rapidly lost its pink sheen because Britain gave back, gave back all of these dependencies and, and protectorates and colonies and so forth. So Britain was just dependent upon producing a nuclear weapon. Now clearly Britain didn't produce a nuclear weapon. The first three or four or five tests that were carried out after the, uh, after the uh, uh, Australians threw the British out of Australia, because fallout from the tests in the Montebello Islands in Western Australia was actually crossing over the whole of Australia, and it was being detected by uh, instruments and by uh, measurements in the thyroid glands of sheep, organised by a man called Headley Marston, who was like an early version of me, I suppose, or I'm a later version of him. And he had a terrible fight with the Australian authorities and with the British to stop the testing over there. And, and, and he argued that the physicists who were doing the testing, just exactly as I do, had no, no idea whatever about the effects that the fallout would have on, on people exposed to it. And we still don't know because nobody's done the studies. But Headley Marston was pursued and persecuted and attacked and so forth, but he stuck to his guns and eventually managed to publish a paper um, which showed that there were high levels of, of radioactivity coming across Australia from the tests that were done in the Montebello Islands. So, they, so the British shifted their testing to Christmas Island and to uh, another set of islands. Uh, oh, is that now? I can't remember anyway. And the earlier tests in the series were quite obviously, and this was what came out in the, in the document um, program, quite obviously enormously big fission bombs. They were not hydrogen bombs. They were not thermonuclear bombs at all. They just wanted to make an enormous bang in order to impress the Americans. And of course the Americans are not stupid, but the people who were working for it, and they figured out that the British didn't know how to make one. 
So then they obviously thought, well, what should we do? Because at that time, there was an enormous reaction in the world to fallout, which, which, which basically followed on from the United States testing in the Marshall Islands of the big Castle Bravo bomb that blew up Bikini and made it into Bikini. So it blew the atoll in half, so you had two halves. And that's why you've got Bikinis now. That, that, um, that landed in, uh, as far away as Japan, and, it, and, it, and it, it wiped out a load of people on a Japanese fishing vessel called the Fukuyura Maru or Lucky Dragon, not very lucky in fact, that was more than 150 miles away. So this all got into the media, and at that, so, so there was enormous pressure all over the world from the public who were realising that there was strontium-90 getting into the milk that their children were drinking to stop nuclear testing. And so my feeling is that what happened is that the United States thought, well, we need to have somebody on our side. We need to have another country on our side that's independent of, of America so we can both have bombs. Then it, then it looks like more like the free world and their bombs versus the Soviet Union and their bombs. It's not just the United States on its own. So at that point, I think somebody made an executive decision to give the British the formulae for the bomb and then to control the British from then on. And I think that is what happened. I think from then on, from the from the... Uh, from the point in time where the United States gave the formula for the bomb to the British and gave and flew the uranium for the bomb into Greenham Common Air Base, the, Britain had become became a sort of offshore fortress of, of the United States military. And of course, from then on, we know that that's exactly what did happen. That that we our, our own independent nuclear deterrent bomb, Red Beard and Blue, whatever it was, Blue Streak or something, those. Those were just quietly abandoned, and the British took on the United States missile um, deployment. So we had the United States in Britain with their missiles in Britain, all pointing at Russia, or, or the Soviet Union. And then we had the Polaris submarines, which fire missiles built in the United States. So, so I think that, that Great Britain has been a puppet of the United States since that time. And this is a very important sort of, if you like, geopolitical issue, because it leads us forward to the point in time now where we're considering possibilities of nuclear war between the free world and, 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 the, and the evil empire, which has now become Putin and Russia. And what we saw is that just as the uh, United States acquired Tony Blair and Britain in their pursuit of Saddam Hussein, which was, in, which was totally insane. I mean, anyone thinking back on it now realizes that it was we were just the puppy dog of the United States as far as Saddam was concerned, Hussein was concerned. We invented a load of nonsense about him, we attacked him, we destroyed him. And look at Iraq now. And we used radioactive weapons. And then of course the same thing in Libya. And then of course the same thing in Syria. So what we see is we see the true nature of a, of a sort of militaristic machine based in the United States which began in the 1950s and has just gone from strength to strength since then. And anyone who stood in its way, like President Kennedy, gets shot. So we're talking about some serious people here, and maybe they'll get me as well. Anyway, maybe the goddess will save me. <laughs> but I just wanted to say something about that, because, because there's more to it, this business of the United States giving Britain the uranium, than just saying, oh, well, let's give Britain some uranium. They don't do it for fun. There's no such thing as a free lunch. They did it because they needed to have a political ally in the production of nuclear weapons. And there's only one reason for the production of nuclear weapons, and that's to win a war using nuclear weapons. And what I say is that's not possible. Nobody can win a war with nuclear weapons. And that's where, that's where I am. That's where I am. That's where I am with the European Committee on Radiation Risk. We show through our research and by, by, by uh, citing other people's research that small amounts of radioactivity, tiny amounts of these new substances like strontium-90 and these, these, these particles of uranium which never existed throughout evolution, cause massive, massive effects to the human genome and of course also effects to the genome of all living systems on Earth. So we can't win a nuclear war. And any of you who have any sort of power or energy or influence or anything at all in this area, you should get this message out as widely as possible. As widely as possible. That the world is going down the toilet because of the United States of America. 
or rather, as some people would say, whoever's running the show there, because, you know, the ordinary Americans don't know what's going on. I mean, they're, they're not the, it's not the people in the United States of America that we have to deal with, it's the Pentagon. Thank you very much.